there's this concept when it comes to interpreting scripture, which is that scripture interprets scripture, right? Now, uh, many Christians rely on circular reasoning to define fornication, right? Because when you look into the definitions and you look into the context of what it's really about, then you'll see that you go into fornication and you'll see G4202, right? In the Strong's Concordance. When you go into that concordance, you'll see that the word porneia means illicit sex acts. So it's not just two people having sex with each other that aren't married, right? It enlists a whole bunch of different things, but you'll never find a law in the Bible that says two people who aren't married to each other can't have sex, right? You'll never find that law. You know, the definitions of fornication, they start with Leviticus 18. And they also take place in a few other areas, right? But nowhere in there is two unmarried people having sex. It's not in there, right? One thing that you may notice is that the sex laws, especially in Leviticus, they range all the way from not having sex on your period. Yes, there's more scriptures in the Bible about having sex on your period than about two people who aren't married having sex. And it ranges all the way from there up to sex with close relatives, uh, sex with animals. Uh, it even touches a homosexuality. And some people have a scriptural interpretation of that that I can't completely argue with. I'm kind of more so on the fence about that one right there myself. But then when they talk about two people who are married having sex to each other, it's always in the context of defrauding property rights, like somebody being betrothed after they pay the higher virgin price to get the woman. And then it turns out that she's not a virgin. If she doesn't bleed, then that woman will be taken out into the street and stoned to death, right? But as far as two people who aren't married, woman's not in her father's house having sex with a man, it's not a thing, right? Because really in the biblical concept, a woman who wasn't a virgin oftentimes wasn't seen as marriageable. Because if you want to go even deeper into the context, like perhaps even... Let's say it's the woman at the well talking, uh, the woman at the well that he met. And he told her that she had five husbands and the one she has right now is not her own. If you really want to go super deep into the context that Jesus gave about it, then if anything, and I'm not saying this is completely what I believe, but if anything, sex itself is marriage, right? And when you talk about marriage, remarriage, adultery that Jesus broke down, then pretty much the first man a woman has sex with is her husband, right? Unless that man dies, for her to then have sex with somebody else would then be considered adultery with every other man after the first one, unless the first one dies, right? So I think a lot of people want to feel like they're being pious. They want to feel like they're being holy. They want to feel like they're looking at scriptures in the most uh, pure way of looking at it. We are highly hypocritical and focused on this circular reasoning of the definition of fornication. Because, you know, when you look back into the history of the word fornication, a lot of the context was predicated upon this idea of prostitution. Because a lot of sexual sins in the Bible are related to ritualistic temple prostitution. Ritualistic temple prostitution. That's a lot of what Paul talked about in the Church of Corinth, right, in, the, in Corinthians. Because there's a lot of ritualistic temple prostitution in the area and he wanted his people to be safe from that because worshiping other gods is one of the things that's considered prostitute. I mean, it's one of those things that's considered fornication based off of the Strong's Concordance. That's why oftentimes the Old Testament, we use the context of Israel whoring after other gods and forget and, and committing fornication. So temp ritualistic temple prostitution was a form of it because to a certain extent, sex and worship are kind of like two things that go together to a certain extent so oftentimes in the context of the bible the husband would be pretty much god in that scenario where a woman opening herself up and receiving that man would be like a symbolically of receiving of you know a human being receiving god you get what i'm saying so to then be worshiping multiple gods would then be seen as an issue now for me i'm more of a fan of consent i'm more of a fan of that and that's really not too much of a biblical concept you know if a man raped a woman right and they weren't found and she didn't kill him and she didn't yell when she was out in the street then that woman would then have to marry the man who who accosted her right unless he was caught and killed on the spot she would have to marry the man who raped her that's some crazy shit right
but that's just some stuff that goes down in the Bible. Another thing is this. A lot of people also like to use uh, the Bible to try to say, oh, it's one man, one wife. There's maybe one, maybe two patriarchs in the Bible who had only one wife. But nobody's going to talk about that, right? Like, let's say it's the issue of the bishop, right? When uh, when Paul was giving certain guidelines for if a man desires the office of bishop, he should have one wife. Now, that can make some sense because maybe he'd be busy with the church affairs. So having multiple wives would be too much for him to be trying to take upon himself and care for the church. But then also one context is should have his first wife. And that also makes sense because it's somebody who's not going to give up on what they do. Right. They're going to stick it out. So it's like either one wife or first wife. But that's only for somebody who desires the office of a bishop. I think oftentimes people let churchianity be what governs their thoughts and their interpretation of scriptures. And they don't really search things out for themselves or seek to gain a certain level of understanding for themselves. It's just whatever they're told. And oftentimes people's consciences aren't really built off of only scripture, only the Bible. You no, know, our biases, our traditions, the values that we were brought up with are going to be things that affect our conscience, right? Now, a person can have a weak conscience. That's true. You know, a person can also have a stronger conscience. But the funny thing is a strong conscience is one that gives you a sense of freedom and isn't overstepping creating more boundaries and hindrances for you and a weak conscience is one that is very sensitive to having its relationship with God thrown off due to things that they may do that they may consider wrong right but I think oftentimes when we're looking at these scriptures and we're looking at these these contexts that there is this idea of what fornication means that many people are afraid that if they jump off of that cycle of sin and guilt, sin and guilt, sin and guilt, right? That if they jump off of that cycle, that although they are going to do what they think is wrong, they're not going to stop. Or they're going to just date somebody for years and years and then wait for the last month or the last, you know, six months of the relationship and to say, okay, cool, well, I think we're going to get married or, you know, let's go ahead and, and get serious. There are people who are celibate who aren't even believers. You get what I'm saying? There's people who are abstinent who aren't even believers. But it's one of those things where it becomes such a pitfall for people who are believers. And my thing is this. Research it for yourself. See if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, come back to me and tell me what you think. You know, tell me what you've researched. But if you ain't going to research it yourself or really give any thought to it, you're just going to uh, rehash some scripture I probably already talked about a thousand times. Then go ahead and, and I'll break it down for you. But... There's a lot of circular reasoning when it comes to how many Christians interpret what fornication is. Right. You got to remember the context is illicit sex acts. What is illicit? It means illegal. Illegal based off of what? Leviticus 18. And also based off of a few other scriptures when it comes to what's considered wrong in the Bible sexually. Right. So. Ms. Brody, I'm out.